It's nothing. One of the things I really liked about reading Jung was that Jung tracks the development of thought, say, back 10,000 years. It's like, wow, that's a 10,000 year span of history. That's a long time. It's like, well, not compared to 300 million years. That's a really long time. Okay, so if we're going to talk about the Darwinian underpinnings of the brain or of the human organism, let's use some time spans. So Dawkins has Darwinism painted on enlightenment rationality. He's a post, he's an enlightenment guy. It's like rationality rules. It's like, this is how you make sense of the world. It's like, okay, well, we've thought that more or less for 400 years. So what did we think for the other, like, 300 million years? How did we manage without that, if it's truth? So, it's a form of truth. It's a partial form of truth. And it's a powerful partial form of truth. But to say it's truth, well, then, depends on what you mean by truth. So... Yeah, well, and that's where it gets back, and that's, that's where it starts to go back into the Darwinian issue, which is there's only one way you can define truth in relationship to finite beings. It's true enough. True enough for what? True enough so that you survive and reproduce. That's it. You don't get to go any farther. What's, what's more true than that? Sorry, can't ask that question. That's it. You've hit the limit, and that's basically Darwin's claim, and that's what the pragmatists recognized as well. So is another way of, that, that's really helpful for what you just went through, that's going to be very useful. So is another way of articulating that what's true is what enables you to successfully achieve a goal. In, you know, in, not, yeah, not, not no, in that's, what, that's what's true enough. Right. right. But, but there's only true enough. But there's like, there's varieties of true enough. So it doesn't turn you into a relativist. It's like some things are only true for one thing. Some things are true for ten things. Some things are true for a million things. It's like, well, that's a better truth. Well, and what, what, what the religious imagination, which is the imagination that's concerned with values, is always trying to determine is, well, what's the highest value? That's the religious question. What's the highest value? Which is, what should you serve, let's say, to ensure your viability across the broadest domain of time? Well, we don't know. So what we've done is, well, we've watched successful people. So what does successful mean? Well, we know what it means. We're, we can stay within the Darwinian framework. I mean, I don't think, by the way, I don't think the Darwinian framework is the last word on things because we're starting to discover, for example, that there are epigenetic transformations. So, you know, we'll see where that goes. It's going to go somewhere very interesting, but that's okay for, for the time being. We're, we're, we're enamored of successful people, okay? There's success. There's a successful person A, there's successful person B, there's successful person C, and what makes them the same is that they're successful. Okay, then the question is, what is successful? Well then, in some sense, the variations of hero mythology are complex answers to that question. It's like, well, if you're a hero, you're successful. Well, there's a bunch of different kinds of heroes. Okay, so you get all these heroes together, they have a big fight. Who comes up on top? Well, I can tell you one answer to that, because that's exactly what happens in Mesopotamian mythology. It's like there's a bunch of heroes, they're gods, and then they're confronted by a horrible chaos monster that actually gave birth to them, that's Tiamat. And they, these gods, they know that singly, she'll just claw them to nothing. So they're all freaking out about this, and then at one point, a new god gets born, his name is Marduk, and he's kind of an interesting god because he can speak magic words, and he has eyes all the way around his head. So they send out a god now and then to go after Tiamat, because she's angry with them for like making too much racket, essentially, and killing her husband. It's not a very good idea. They're careless. They're like two-year-olds, really. So. They throw out a god now and then to go fight Tiamat, but she just wallops them. There's not even any contest. So, they, this Marduk is born and he grows up and they're pretty impressed with him. So, they ask him one day, well, how would you like to go out and fight Tiamat? And, you know, maybe he's not too thrilled about that. But he says, okay, okay, I'll do it. But here's the rule. Call a council. You put me in charge. I'm top god. And that means from here on in, I determine destiny. So, he's the thing that determines the way the future is going to unfold. And, you know, they're not that happy about that, but they arrange them into a hierarchy and they put him on top. 
and then he goes out and he catches Tai Mat in a net, so he conceptualizes her, so to speak, cuts her into pieces, makes the world out of her. It's like that's what a human being does. Pays attention to where the chaos is, encapsulates it, cuts it up, makes the world. One of his names was actually he who makes ingenious things out of the combat with Tiamat. Was it actually like a literal name of Marduk? And so the Mesopotamian emperor had to imitate Marduk. So to the degree that he had sovereignty, the reason he had sovereignty was he, he was a Marduk. So, and then he could be a good Marduk or a bad Marduk. So at the New Year's festival, they'd take the king outside the city, so that's out into chaos. They'd strip him of his kingly clothes, and then they'd make him kneel, and then he had to confess to all the ways that year he hadn't been a very good Marduk. They'd actually hit him with something first. Then he had to confess, well, I wasn't a good Marduk this way or that way. And, you know, so he got all his sins out in the open. And then they had a big ceremony with, with the, like the statues of the gods. They replayed the battle between Marduk and Tiamat. And then they, there were some other things that happened too, which I won't get into. But then, the, then they went back inside and the new year was renewed. So they acted out the, the eternal battle between attention, say, and embodied attention and chaos and they re realized that reverence for that was the was the was the basis for valid authority valid authority and the king had a moral obligation to act in that manner that's why he got to be king it's like brilliant now you say well are they conscious of this they're conscious enough to act it out right that's as conscious as they were they could use their bodies and their collective as a representational mechanism. But they couldn't, you know, and then they could tell stories about it too. But as far as deriving out what that meant philosophically and in a fully articulated way, it's like, no, they couldn't do that. Which is fascinating for me. So, what that seems to imply, at least in my conclusion, what you're saying, is that religious systems that are often derided by, by say, enlightenment or post enlightenment thinkers for their. Um, for axioms that are just not true, they're mm -hmm. false about the world, right? Like, right, that, well, yeah. that's, a religion, that's a religious superstition, that's clearly wrong, right. it's backwards. Mm -hmm. Well, what you're saying is they were, they were and are very much true in the sense that they are almost pre-conscious representations of correct action. And the environment in which correct action takes place, which is fundamentally the dominance heart, right? You know, like, we don't contend with protons and atoms. We contend mostly with other people. And to some degree, we contend with nature, right? But nature is sort of outside our proper domain. Right? That's partly why that idea infuses environmentalism. It's right? like we, environmentalism is mythology right to the core. It's like pure mother nature. She's a virgin, right? And she's being raped by the terrible father and, the, and his evil sons. It's like, yeah, yeah, true. But what about the good father and his good sons and cancer and, you know, um, oh, there was this horrible worm in Africa that used to burrow inside people's skin. Yeah, it's horrible. And it was just eradicated, eh? So some doctor took it upon himself to get rid of that worm. It's like, yeah, well, that's Mother Nature too, you know. So environmentalism is an ideology because it only tells half the story. Of course, people are rapacious and horrible. You know, and Mother Nature is beautiful and virginal. It's like, yeah, yeah, but she's also an absolute terror. And you better be thankful for the fact that you have a roof over your head and that everybody isn't an adversarial rapist. So, you know, you better balance out the story a little bit. So the, 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 the stories tell you how to act, but they also tell you what the environment is. No, not environment. They tell you how to conceptualize, they, they model the nature of being. That's the best way of thinking about it, actual being. And in being is the social world. How do you act in relationship to the social world? Let me tell you a simpler story. Okay. Oh, yeah? Just to follow okay. up, is it that our, what you're saying is, is that the different mythologies at different points in time will tell you how to act under particular conditions in which that, in which that society developed? No, no, it's broader than that. It's broad. It's broader. Well, look, I had a student once who said, well, if these archetypes are true, why don't we just tell the archetypal story over and over? Why do we need, like, literature? And I thought, oh, that's a pretty good question. And then I thought, 
Well, for much of human history, we just told the archetypal story over and over. Okay, so, but then there's this tension. So this is why I think that there's three persons in the Christian Trinity. It's like there's, there's the Holy Ghost, we'll just forget about him for a minute, but there's God the Father, that needs no explanation, that's, you know, the benevolent element. Benevolent. That's the Great Father. And then there's the Son, that's the hero. Okay, but the hero is weird because there's this sort of Logos hero that's been there since the beginning of time. That's Logos, right? That's the word. And then there's Jesus Christ, the carpenter. He's this guy that lived in, you know, some little bitty irrelevant village 2,000 years ago and died young. Why do you need him? Well, it's because the universal isn't real till it's been made particular. And what we are are particular manifestations of the universal. And the particular and the universal are both important. So the general pattern is crucial, but so are the details. So, so the archetype is a general pattern. You know, it's not, you have to, your religious task in a sense is to figure out how to embody the archetype in actual time and space. So it's a pattern, but, but you know, you still have to fill in the details. And it's not like the details are irrelevant, they're really relevant.